Oh, hey, another day. So, it's under a week until I actually have to do this for real. Let's see, before I go into the details, let's see what happened today. I did go to LA Public Library. I read up on some of the Unixware or Unix World issues. Did some editing, took the train down there. Then I, I don't know, I sort of wandered around downtown and tried to have a good day out of it. Uh, beyond that, let's see, I gotta do some other unrelated things tonight, but, um, yeah, let's just go through it and see what, see what it's like right now. So I've done some editing. Oh, I said I'd be using this wand thing a few days ago, the one that looks like a pregnancy test. Um, let's see if it works. Is that on or off? Uh, that was on. Okay, so... Oh, it does. I just have to give it focus. All right? Ah, look there. And then I'm using uh, a tablet to do the reading. So eventually when I'm ready, I'll be printing it out in pieces of paper. But I don't want to like... <laughs> it's like 30 pages long. So I don't want to like do every draft in 30 pages. That's just that's like something that my dad would do. Oh, just, I'm not that old. Anyway, uh, let's try to get some tea things here, and then I'll be ready to go. Hmm. And I always have to look down at my timer. So I'll start around the two minute mark, I think. Then just go for it. Hmm. Things might be better today. I always hope for that. About eight seconds or so. I mean, you know, doing some pageless mode would actually be preferable. But it's too late now. I gotta go. So, um, Linux is microcomputer predecessors pre-1996. Uh, if you find any mistakes, I built something for you to correct me. You'll also find the script I'm reading. There's a, this is a general talk, so here's some of the players for our 20th century journey if you haven't met them. In fact, maybe, maybe just having this thing in my hand might be easier. Because I'm just not looking down all the time. Let's warm, let's warm up the time machine. Uh, we all use Linux, even if we don't know it. Whenever you see a machine reboot at a grocery store, it's like, oh, hey, there's a penguin again. Linux has arguably become the most ubiquitous operating system. How did that happen? The story, usually given, is an undergrad posted about his hobby project, and a bunch of people helped out. Wait, a college kid with a hobby project started a computer revolution by posting? That's absurd. What about these other things? They're only the Unix ones. Uh, Oberon by Pascal's Nicholas Worth is from 1987, and there were many other ones that didn't make the deck. But these did. Here's various commercial efforts. Some of them are complete systems, others are kernels. The lines are between the first and last release. The point is Linus wasn't shouting out from the wilderness. There was a vibrant PC Unix ecosystem that predated him, an industry which hasn't had a lasting impact. Products such as Xenix and Coherent were hot stuff at one time, but now are the works of Ozymandias. Look on the timeline, ye mighty, and despair. That's because this guy, Genghis Khan, the Unix War. There's only one commercial Unix without hardware attached to it still around. Xenuos Unixware 7 Definitive 2018, which last release was actually 2017, and that's it. It's deader than dial-up. But Mr. McKenzie, there's more to that story. What about the BSD lawsuit? Well, what about it? BSD has a long history stretching back to 1976. The two names for a story are a husband and wife team, Bill and Lynn Jolitz. Why didn't that win the Unix War? This is usually given, but it's not persuasive. BSD is much older, and in an interview with Bill Jolitz in 1994, he said he started working on 386 BSD in 1986, even though only Net 1 and Net 2 were released in that interim. Also, there were five lawsuits that held up the Linux in court over a decade. Did that affect its development? Okay, let's assume there was a two-year hold on BSD. Then we should go over to, say, Usenet and see a fair amount of silence during this time. But in fact, we don't. This is just over two days. It was lively and vibrant. There is no evidence of any chilling effect. The highlighted post is an update on the lawsuit, amidst a bunch of articles talking about progress and bugs. Mapping out the velocity of Usenet articles and BSD groups to uh, looking for change correlated with the court cases showed nothing of interest. Mapping out the velocity... And BSD groups 
looking for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's another thing is that I can't actually edit this damn thing. So I have to, oh, oh I'm in viewer mode on editing. Let me just do the end line. I rewrote that thing and I didn't like it. Uh, and then I have to, how do I, how do I go to viewer mode? That's how I do it. Uh, also, there's a few first mover advantage theory, which is where people write history from the first successful implementation and forget everything that came before. There were digital currencies before Bitcoin, MP3 players before iPod, and social media before Facebook. Linux's timing was favorable, but that's there's more to success than that. So here we have to reject the hypothesis that BSD was held back because there is no contemporaneous evidence. Tell me how wrong I am, go to the URL, and denounce me at your leisure. And I put the thing down that I actually needed. Uh... Regardless, Linux has become a few orders of magnitude more prevalent than BSD and killed the commercial Unix. How? Here's two possibilities. The great man theory and a social history. The second is harder. Let's try the first one. It looks easy. It says some glorious thing happened, but you can't do it because you don't have the right genes. Unfortunately, this isn't useful unless you enjoy sulking about things you consider flops. But you're all rock stars, right? So what about the second? Using syllogisms, mere mortals did this. We are mere mortals. Therefore, we can do this but only if we know how. The first is a much shorter speech, a Carlisle-style hero worship about how great men should rule and others should revere them, a gushing mystical biopic. However, we've got a much harder job. And to do that, you must have defendable and falsifiable hypotheses. But first, here's more jargon. Perhaps Linux was the second act of the personal computer revolution. Personal computer on personal hardware. If the center will not hold, things fall apart, and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, we might as well make it productive and get some nice software out of it. Maybe a free Unix needed a pool of hackers to build it on cheap computers with a robust communication network and avoid bad actors taking advantage of their generosity. Maybe. There's also the maybe nots, that falsifiable thing. Number one, Unix was thought to be really complicated. Actually, it was seen as quite elegant and simple. The Unix source license was $200,000 in the 80s, so of course it was complicated and magical. But that was marketing. Even 3D6 PSD, 30, 20 years later, was done by the Dolitzes, the husband and wife team. Just two people. Number two, community-based programs were thought impossible. There's an organization called Share who came up with the Share operating system in the late 1950s, which was community-developed. Share was eventually structured closer to a buyer's cooperative. To see how it worked in the bur- at the birth of Unix, let's go to Computer World 1968. During the past four months, Share has been working with IBM to define changes needed by users. When the company responded, 12 out of the 13 requests had been turned down. Well, IBM, look what happens to you when you ignore the users. Oh yeah, Share was Los Angeles based of LA Pride. Speaking of things that happened before I was born. Uh, this is ancient history. Oh, you know what? Is this thing actually? Well, f- well fuck you too, stupid thing. Oh, oh, yes, right, because I'm up here. Okay. We have to move this thing down to here. This entire thing has been crazy because you haven't seen all of my damn things. We'll go back to the other 15 uh, decks I've done on this one, so it's okay. Um, And I'll go over the new stuff after I'm done as well. Uh, Although Unix started in... Oh, oh, then I have to go up here again and focus. Although Unix started in 1968, the first paper was five years later. Here's four principles extracted from it that will be useful for a journey. Leverage, don't invent. Doing beats planning. Needs, not desires. Use early, use often. Although each one may have its flaws, together they form a cohesion, even a synergy, if you will. Unix was designed for a class of computers that died out, called mini computers. They were about an order of magnitude or two cheaper than mainframes, but and also less capable. Well, at first, people wanted to solve their tasks on cheaper machines because that's all they had access to. Roughly every, every decade, a new lower-priced computer class forms based on a new programming platform, network, and interface resulting in a new usage and new industry. That's Bell's Law. It's from 1972. As many computers came on the market and became more powerful, Unix was there to leverage them to service people's needs. These new machines provide a new context for new software. The needs are only meant as examples. The point is the velocity of computer progress went faster than people's needs. Apparently, computer performance increased as a square of the cost, and transistors per chip doubled every 18 months. Those are called Grosch's Law and Moore's Law. Together, it meant the industry eventually ate itself through a multi-decade-long digestion. However, when new things come on in, the people who get there don't get there easy. It's okay, though. Some of us are crazy and prefer it. AT&T was under many legal restrictions, and because of that, Unix was initially distributed as if it came out of the back of an unmarked white van. Uh, The mantra was part of the presentation deck for early Unix, saying you're on your own. Think of the adventure. 
They think of the excitement. But who are you catering to with such a message? Where will their behavior guide things? It's not about welcoming everybody doing anything. With any of these efforts, you have to ask yourself who you're bringing to the door and what kind of behavior you're expecting. That's what separates a library from a soccer field. For example, then it's October 1991. You also need to be something of a hacker to set it up. So for now, for those hoping for an alternative to Minix 3D6, please ignore me. It's currently meant for hackers interested in operating systems and 3 d sixes with access to Minix. Maintaining focus is about intentionality. Intentionally, not incidentally, but actually intentionally choosing what to ignore. You have to be a clear signal amongst our noisy world. Because you had to know what you were doing, Unix was initially introduced through engineering and technical people and not through the conventional decision makers. But it worked, and by the 80s, Unix was mainstream. As both the consumers and producers of Unix multiplied, the suppliers differentiated themselves, succumbing to the trappings of usual competitive markets by enclosing the commons, trying to take ownership of groups and commonly held things by setting up barriers, thus locking them in and growing their bases by trying to be special, which led to fragmentation. Unix had infected everything from workstations to mainframes. Unisys, one of the mainframe makers, had an article in a September 1987 issue of Computer World predicting a tripling in Unix sales in that year. The problem with the infighting goes back to the chart with various blobs or rack computer classes. The threat is almost always coming from below. In this case, it's Microsoft and microcomputers and not Nixdorf Cynics on NS32000 versus clicks on an Intergraph Interpro. In 1985, Microsoft argued that their Uni Xenix Unix, which had an install base of 100,000, would be a multi-user multi version of DOS. In 87, they said they didn't see it competing with their plans for OS 2, which at the time was seen as successor to Windows 1.0. I know things changed, specifically that December, with the introduction of Windows 2.0, and later with Windows for Workgroup and NT. That was the real threat. Anyway, Xenix required 12 360k floppies, which was seen as bonkers. A 32 gigabyte microSD card is about 93,000 floppies, 190 meters stacked end-to-end. That's about a two and a half minute walk. All that storage is now in the size of your thumbnail and costs as much as a taco on the west side. Anyway, software distribution used to suck. Speaking of Microsoft, that punch taped is how they distributed BASIC for the Altair in the 1970s. It took about 20 minutes to load, and it wasn't stored on disk, but the Altair didn't have one. Just keep the computer on if you want to use the software. The lower right is called a type in program. Software was distributed like this as multiple pages of hexadecimal. No, really, this is MLX format. They published things like this every month for years. You typed it in. There was no electronic reader. There's some basic on the first page, and it's not easy either. In fact, what if I just do this? How do I? How do I huh? Hello. Uh, the QR code is this game running on an emulator in your browser. You can scan it and just tap it on your phone. Night typing required. Any, anyone want to scan and give it a try? You could only use the software you had access to. There were also software user groups, which were convenient for the 1 in 20 people who lived near one. But for most, uh, oh, that's right, I need to go up here again. But for most, software meant retail, mail order, or copying a floppy from a friend. The bottom two methods had consumer overhead. For dial-up, you usually had to pay an expensive phone bill, and for internet, you probably didn't have it. 2400 BPS access to Genie in 1989, for instance, was $42 an hour, and that's how long it takes to get a megabyte over 2400 BPS. This means most people were only exposed to the top three groups, and it was difficult for smaller developers and non-commercial ones to get their software to the masses. Paraphrasing Marketing High Technologies by Bo Davidow in 1986. It's not a product without a distribution channel, or in Linux's case, a distribution. The technology may have the potential to address the needs of many, but without specialists and redistributors to put it in the hands of those customers, it will not succeed. Products are sold through distribution, not to distribution. Let's jump forward to the why Linux question here for a bit while this diagram is up. Linux had high accessibility in the install media. March 1993, Unix World listed FTP repos, uh, BBS numbers, and a soft landing software who uh, would mail you a copy of SLS for $3.75. Later, you could find uh, Linux at coffee shops, libraries, and attached to magazines at the grocery store. Filling up a CD with a Linux distro, distro and cribbing some well-written how-tos was cheap content for a magazine who just wanted to get an issue out. But let's go back to the problems. Depending on the distribution channel, updates had different logistic complexity, especially when considering updates from outsiders. For instance, if you wanted to update the retail Lotus 123 and have your changes appear on the shelf of Circa City, you'd probably have to do it yourself and get arrested. It would have been fun, though. Uh, once there were online networks with storage and communication necessary to unlock multiplayer online mode for software development game, a new way to write software was created. Yaki Benkler described this as common-based ba peer production in his book The Wealth of Networks. Let's go to Linus, 1991. I've enjoyed doing it, and somebody might enjoy looking at it and even modifying it for their own needs. It's still small enough to understand, use, and modify, and I'm looking forward to any comments you might have. I'd like to hear from you so I can add your software to the system. 
Adding Minix things to Linux is fine, but how do contrib contributions and updates work? Unless you can answer these questions easily, progress will be slow, infrequent, and inefficient. Everyone has to agree on the terms and feel welcome, otherwise they don't come around here no more. So GNU made a Rooseveltian list of four software freedoms to define free software. But it's not just license, it's organization plus license. For our purposes, we're going to talk about horizontal software development, which labeled adoptive on this chart. Even, essentially, how easy is it for modifications to become integrated and in the same distribution channels and other people to become a distributor or to share your product? You need a legal structure and organizational structure that affords this, an open shop that permits anyone to come in. Eric Raymond spoke to this in the Cathedral and the Bazaar. There is the Cathedral model, which is tall, in which source code is available, but development is restricted to an exclusive group. Contrast this with the Bazaar model, which is flat, and which uh, uh, the code is developed over the internet in view of the public. The vertical lines here, from permissive to restrictive, is a general continuum. Public domain is seen as too permissive in the eyes of GNU because you can relicense and reprivatize things. I've also read that copyleft and GPL are different from each other, but I never went to law school. If you zoom in, you can see non-computer things. Let's go over a few. Bottom right is facts. People ought to be really hesitant to modify facts and their public domain. Above that, you have most religions. Anybody can preach the good word and start a congregation, but at least in principle, the texts are sacred. Uh, as we go up, we get jokes, recipes, human language, and at the top is folklore, which changes readily. As you move to the left of public domain, you get Wikipedia, which anyone can edit. On the restrictive adoptive side of social media, anyone can contribute, but the platforms retain a bunch of rights. Classic commercial software is down in the hesitant and restrictive camp. The pink stuff is all the Linux related. Minix is down, Nexus Freeware, and GCC in a hesitant uh, category below the pool label Unix is. Except for social media and Wikipedia, this is all early 1990s and not 2024 accurate. Speaking of the past, let's go to the introduction of Minix. In 1986, commons-based peer production wasn't feasible. Oh, what happened? In 1986, commons-based peer production wasn't feasible. People didn't have the internet in their pockets like you do. Because of the prohibitive logistics around software distribution updates, especially customer-initiated, Minix could only be a cathedral. Also, it was a product of Princess Hall, who wanted to sell textbooks and instructional material for Tannenbaum. So... Here's the relevant parts of the announcement. It's not public domain. However, the publisher does not object to people making copies for friends. This is SneakerNet. If you want to sell it, which is the two categories above SneakerNet, retail and mail order, you need permission. In his book, you will find a postcard that you can use to order the software. That's your mail order again, and he says he doesn't want to copy a bunch of floppies, as in do SneakerNet. Now, I also mentioned Minix was adjacent to GCC. What's up with that? GNU was also a cathedral. Uh, here is an example uh, from an early GNU bulletin, 1987. We can see it listing out uh, different distribution channels as they solicited funds to pay programmers to write more software like a software engineering firm. They played a second role as a provider of copyleft and eventually software under the GPL, which came out a few years later. Every bulletin has a growing list uh, of, by others, of software by others that you could order basically at cost. You could get Net2 BSD and the BSD 4.4 Lite from them until 1995, after which they said they were working on Linux distribution, which never happened. Linux came from below. They didn't see it. As far as distributing free stuff goes, there's precedents, such as this one from 1976, trying to be a software repository for public domain software, from smaller producers such as code publishers in, say, Dr. Dobbs' journal. Similar assembly programs ran over 40 pages in that publication, and you, of course, were expected to type it in yourself. So people were looking for a more reasonable Reasonable solution didn't cost much, but not all the pieces were there yet. All of the things that all of these things required labor, coordination, and resources. How we instrument those let some things get better, more better over time. Ideas are bizarre even when their implementations are cathedrals. For instance, there were many graphical desktop computers, even though each one was a proprietary restrictive project. The superstructure of desktop computers operated in the adoptive space. Pretend we have a concept of a free operating system. We may not get all the parts right the first time, but the platonic ideal exists. Well, kind of. It's as much a contemporaneous idea as anything else, as a pale, true thought suspended in our life stream. We can go back to Vannevar Bush's Memex article, as we may think, in the Atlantic from 1945, to see the spirit of what we now call many things. Unlike products, platonic ideas are collective projects owned by nobody. They're permissive and adoptive, and not static abstractions divorced from human influence. Their ideas manifested from context. The map is not the territory, and in our industry, we're tasked with creating both through pure thought stuff. What a responsibility we better organized. This is about the complexities of building software and not about electing people. 
You may have heard that commercial software began with Bill Gates' open letter to computer hobbyists in 1976 when he denounced SneakerNet distribution of Altair Basic because they didn't get paid for each of the copies. That's not really when commercial software began. In the mid-1950s, software was in-house, coupled with hardware, or contract-based, as you can see in this 1959 ad for a programmer from Punch Card Data Processing. But the version of commercial software that has products for a computer you already own has existed since at least 1960. Uh, no, really. This is another falsifiable thing. Bruce Parent's chapter in Open Sources, Stephen Levy and Hackers, they allude to a Garden of Eden in the past where we had fallen from from which we had fallen where all software was free. Really? Well, no. Here, 1966, commercial software was a $100 million industry. And then in 1969, 11 companies worth at least $100 million each got together to form a trade group. Hardware vendors bundled software to lock in their customers like Microsoft did with Internet Explorer. It was as free as Windows is on a retail laptop. People were trying to DRM and patent software back in the 60s. Maybe there was some idyllic Valhalla in the bubble known as the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, but the real world was up to the same tricks they are now. Anyways, deep bundling happened in 1968 and 69. Vendor by vendor, a new arose from the primordial soup and is one of the oldest non-mainframe software that is still recognizable today. Recognizable because the family tree looks like a European dynasty. The Unix timeline covers a few years in the late 80s. Zooming in, you'd see Minix, MIT Tricks, SunOS, Mock, Xenix from the House of Free Software, or AT&T, or the Kingdom of Microsoft. I'm still not a lawyer, but this is really confusing. Not only did the source and binary have different terms, but sometimes only certain organizations had access to them. For instance, if you were an educational institution with a pre-existing AT&T license, then you had access to BSD, I think. Uh, so a version might have multiple parents, each with a different term, a sheet. It's a legal Habsburg. That's why a few slides ago, there was a puddle labeled Unixes. Even the Unix term itself is a confusing mess. Raise your hand if you still think it's copyrighted by AT&T. No. 31 years ago, AT&T's USL sold the copyright to Novell, who then donated it to the Open Group, which is now a standard organization. Some Linuxes have gone through that process, so Linux is now a Unix. Really, you're just finding out about that right now. This stuff is absurd. We need something with clean, documented history, a clear license, and easy answers to all these questions. So Linux and effectively all modern open source product projects have this solved. All development is open, the history is well archived, and OSI approved licenses solve the family tree problems. The structure that's now ubiquitous is one of Linux's major contributions. Also, let's look at the internal politics of building software. In the abstract Penguin side, uh, we covered the outside aspirational curve where things take decades and opinions are strong and many. Things like paradigmatic ways of doing open source software development took 20 years to dominate because of the longevity and applicability of the more abstract solutions is also on the same time frame as their implementations. But within that exists lower level Maslowian motivations. And keeping things there make them more actionable. Let's say my network card isn't sending out packets. We can say this bug is known, agreed upon, and demonstrable. So although though it can be, it may not be easy, the labor path is traversable. Now a new network card comes out. You need it to work in Linux. That's a need. You can demonstrate and come to an agreement on what that would look like. Now pretend you want that card to do something it wasn't designed to do. That's harder to demonstrate and agree upon. To get that actionable, you need to pull the desire into the lower curve so that a development cycle can encompass it. It's worth noting the Tannenbaum and Torvald uh, debate from 1982 to illustrate this. Tannenbaum chastised Torvald's approach because it wasn't a microkernel and Linux was a closer to 386. Really, Lin Linux was there in these lower curves, and Tannenbaum was trying to pull it up to the higher curves where things move fa far slower. That's where the hot research always is, people trying to make these higher level concepts more real. GNU Herd is a microkernel approach, Stallman claimed in the early 2000s, that's why it was taking so long and wasn't very stable. The higher level curves are unlikely to succeed as, uh, except as superstructures of the lower level functions, in the same way that our asymmetric approach to platonic ideals happens on the back of incrementally more appropriate implementations, which is why you can snake a line from the 1950s IBM share organization to GitHub. Though the pro through, through that process of clarifying the aspirations, they get moved to the concrete because they become material needs and bug problems. The clarity of their presence stands on both the triumph and the wreckage of the past. Here is both an article and an advertisement from May 1990. Sun says they have a cheap $6,700 computer. Here's a PC at about one-tenth the cost, which is fine, if you can do some of the same things. Historically, that answer had been no, but referring back to the chart, with needs and computing classes, this dynamic was likely to change soon, especially since the 3D6 had technical features, which made running Unix-style operating systems more practical. But that's not the only kind of price there is. There's also the price of time. This is a conceptual and not quantitative graph. Essentially, Windows is the easiest to get up and running, 
But let's say you wanted to do something like convert a bunch of files, sort the contents, uh, pick a field, extract the values, do some operations. Th these things will get hard quickly. Early on, the BSDs were a pain to set up, but they had networking before Linux. They were more professional. However, there were fewer people working on it who tended to be more experienced, so they were busy and expensive. Linux was mostly students, which are famously cheap. Linux was also heavily hobbyist-oriented, which usually meant the systems were more hackable. While the other Unixes, they presumed you had something important to do. The more difficult and time-consuming it is for a customer to use an information system, the less likely they will, that they will use that information system. That's Calvin Moore's 1959. As the complexity of problems become more intractable, the approachability of the lower levels and internals of a system become increasingly important because people tend to use the most convenient method in the least exacting model mode available and stop as soon as minimally acceptable results are found. That's the principle of least effort. Hackers tend to build worlds where everything is possible, but nothing of interest is easy. Alan Perlis called this the Turing Tar Pit in 1982. Pulling yourself out of the tar pit from a, uh, from a capable to a usable system requires some engine to push it forward. Commons-based peer production can also be seen as prosumer, a producer and a consumer put together. It's used often for social media when you are consuming other co consumers' productions. Here, our engine is problem-solution integration. Uh, which keeps us in the bugs needs development cycle. With the bizarre uh, method of, of development, the changes reflect back quickly, which means that the new users have fewer problems with their different hardware, so that for other people with, say, your natural card, it would just work. But where do you find people to do that? Well, you build armies, of course. Large networks are important. Their utility scales with the size of the network because the combinations of groups grow faster than the utility of the groups that formed. That's Reed's law. For example, if we start using Linux, you have a network card that doesn't work. You now join the subgroup of people, becoming a we that, that needs this card to work. This only becomes an engine if we have the right people to complete the cycle we talked about. The first level here are enthusiasts, developers, and bug fixers, followed by the curious hobbyists, and then the business needs and finally people that can't have things fail. Arguably, one of the failings of the early BSD is that they were too lopsided on the upper steps and couldn't get the virtuous cycle moving with enough velocity. Analyzing email addresses of about 2.5 million Usenet posts over a two-year period, there were almost always more commercial emails for BSD and more educational ones for Linux. So even though their general trend was ascending the staircase, Linux had more torque from the bottom groups. I call this Linux's revolutionary theory. The hacker vanguard forms a coalition with the personal computer proletariat and a business-oriented bourgeoisie becomes interested and finally prohibitively assiduous aristocracy is able to use it. There is one last type of price that is of expertise, whether it's your own or you're fronting some catch. It's expensive. You could roughly assign a utility function to the uh, as the capabilities divided by the effort required. Sometimes both capabilities and effort over time. Uh, for instance, Sometimes both capabilities and effort increase over, over time. Blender, for instance, is highly capable software, but also takes a lot of expertise to use effectively. Many old mobile and web apps, on the other hand, actually remove power user features over time and make the product require less effort while also making it less capable. Still other software, frameworks, for example, get Fred Brooks' second uh, system, uh, a new version that's more difficult to use, and leads to inferior results, thus being the inversion of the graph and decreasing utility of the product. Let's talk about the multiple arrows. In order to get a larger user base, you need a diversity of capabilities requiring a diversity of efforts. Linux was able to do this by outsourcing the actual packaging of the OS through distributions. There is another insight about the bizarre software model. Since the entire structure is more flat that, and structural organization barriers are mostly removed, as markets uh, naturally subdivide and form, they can be quickly and readily addressed. Because we're doing social history, let's use the critical theorist Marcuse's law of de-radicalization. The dominant structures, say markets, subsume the novel. However, because in bazaars people can self-organize, they be beat it to the punch, and move faster than market forces, which is why open source decoupled structures are more dynamic and swift-footed than commercial approaches. Here's a chart from Innovator's Dilemma describing different strategies that can be taken as technology gets better. You can push up market to higher-end consumers, or you can stay with your existing customers. However, because of the horizontal development of Linux and the existence of distributions run by multiple organizations, it was able to do multiple strategies at once. Not only these, but any others that hadn't been left out of the graft. That hadn't left out of the graft. Um, 
A few slides ago, we saw how Linux has a horizontalist, a bizarre approach to software internally. Let's look at the implications of this externally. This chart is taken from Andy Grove's 1995 text, Only Paranoids Survive, describing how the industry moved from one-stop shop verticals to a horizontal structure. If we put this in the aspirational space, this can be viewed as part of the same decoupling superstructure as what the mainframes were doing in the 16, late 1960s. <laughs> late 1600s, yes, 1600s mainframes. Um, the premise of this transition was a book called This Coming uh, Computer Industry Shakedown by Stephen McClellan in 1984. Quoting after I take a short drink. As software gains ascendancy, a new world word, a new word will arise to characterize the activities of the industry. The key words will no longer be, in fact, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to change this little quote right here. It's too wordy. So I'm going to say, uh, as software ascendancy gains ascendancy, the key words will no longer be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The new word will be integration. Systems integration will be the most sophisticated and difficult task uh, computer companies will have to undertake. Okay. Oh, shit. I like went. Oh my god. You you dumb fuck. It went it went out. So viewing mode. It went like back to like the list of documents. What are we on? Page 56. Oh, this is terrible. Uh the quote being 40 years old gives us the privilege of seeing what happened. Uh, essentially, four strategies were developed to tackle this problem. The first is to impose on the vertical by claiming you're the standard, but in practice, only one player can do that, so OS2 died. Apple took a different route by being its own vertical, and Linux had to push the wheel out of the tar pit and needed enough people to do it. Uh, while Linux had to push. Yeah. yeah, those two ands don't work. Oh, you fucker. Come on. I want you to go to the edit mode. Uh, you know, I like the the dual mode here, but for whatever reason, it is very difficult. Uh, I wouldn't have remembered that, so I did it. Anyway, um, luckily the timing was on our side. Uh, when the internet was mostly accessed at university, September annually brought in a flood of new people that had to be coached. As residential internet grew, the old guard from 1993, uh, the old guard term 1993 as the eternal September, the beginning of the mainstreaming of internet access. For this to happen, cheap ISPs and web servers needed to exist quickly and to support users, and Linux was there to provide. It's important to know that Linux was prima facie hobbyist and personal use oriented at this time, even though Linux Journal has articles in 1994 about it as a web server and running ISPs. Contemporary texts such as Linux getting started, unleashing the workstation in your PC, or plug and play Linux were in the lower two steps of our staircase, hobbyist and personal. The early Slackware MCC and SLS distros from the time also did include web servers or tools to run the business. The first people in that new use case didn't get there uh, with clean off-the-shelf solutions. They play the scout role, clearing the road for the army to roll in, which is why the web server book in 1995 now includes Linux. Another benefactor in eternal September is attributed to Linux's law. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Let's look at the various eyeballs. The, the first uh, term slide claimed that Linux was mostly built by college students. Here are some evidence. After releasing in October, Linus got some help from a local friend, but by November he had contributions from Hong Kong, MIT, and the University of Utah. In December, contributions came from Calgary and Berkeley, and then Colorado and Maryland students contributed in January. So far, everyone is under 25, and there becomes an increasingly pressing need for a solution like Linux to solve new problems. And those needs more or less persist to this day. Apple is vertical, Microsoft is entitled, and Linux contributes, continues to climb stairs that have yet to be drawn. Here's a quote by Torvalds. I think the timing was good. Even just a year earlier, I don't think it could have been done, and a year later, somebody else would have done something similar. These two bottom charts show how Linux now dominates the supercomputer and web server space. How's everyone doing? Are you still awake? Yes, that's typed on the sheet, as is this. This is long, so let's have some fun. If there was a storefront named Open Source... What would be displayed on this Windows? In fact, let's do some interactive theater. We are a group of people in 1985 trying to bring free software to the masses. Our marketing director just told us about the marketing mix with the four Ps, product, price, place, and promotion. 
In order to have a figurehead for the free software movement, we need to find a place uh, of free software that qualifies these conditions. It should be easier to try, acquire, and understand. It should have a low price of time, money, and expertise. I appreciate all the suggestions so far. These are all excellent examples of free software. I especially like the elevator pitch for Emacs org mode. Before we settle on a project, I'm wondering if we've left anything out. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, any suggestions from the audience? Oh, yes, you, sir, the man who I've known for over a decade. Oh, that's a great idea. Maybe Linux could be the window dressing of the free software movement. Or how about this? I have an even better idea. Let's make an alt copyright pipeline. We have low effort things for curious PC users to try. Then we tell them the beliefs of our community and get them up to up their commitments. As they do, they'll become more familiar with projects which take effort and expertise, get more involved and be an advocate for them. Over time, some of those people will aid us in reporting bugs, determining needs and implementing desires to move our aspirational goal project forward to make it more tangible. In order to do this, we must be a welcoming community by necessity, but also because we brought in the right people. So. That's how it happened. Let's see. Oh, wait. Uh, how do we do it again? The final boss. Jeffrey Moore made this graph in his work Crossing the Chasm in 1991. It proposes as commercial products mature, users with different behaviors and expectations come around. There's two holes in this graph. The first group is people who are aspirational and have a high tolerance for impracticality. They are willing to go the extra mile to make something work. Then there's a small hole. In the graph on the right with electric car adoption in Norway, you can see that small slump, the first circle. The next group is enthusiastic about the possibilities, but prefers a lower effort and expertise cost. Then there's a really big hole. That's the yellow circle on the graph. The next group is the difficult one to reach. They're looking for a working product and don't want to be hassled with inconvenience. M many products don't make it there. I present Crossing the Open Source Chasm. The first group are passionate hackers trying to clot the aspirational curve and bring it down to the bugs and needs. If they can keep their passions going long enough and make sufficient progress, then perhaps the music makers will come around and help recruit more passionate people to enlarge that base. That's the first pipeline. If the engine between the passion and the enthusiast can be maintained in order to get to the problem solution integration wheel, the project can get pulled out of the turning tar pit, and if the software capabilities divided by the efforts demanded yields enough of a utility ratio, then a pragmatist will become interested and the chasm is crossed. But it's important to keep the pipeline well lubricated because you'll be facing new challenges and use cases, and you'll need a few of those new users to slide along the responsibility graph in order to grow the coalition as the law of division takes hold. The clarity of the present stands on both the triumph and the wreckage of the past. Sometimes, for a city to become great, it must first be destroyed so that a new generation can seize the dream and try to execute it better. Failure and a passage of time unbinds us from the commitments and gives us permission to kill our darlings and do a page one rewrite by naturally creating space for us to try again, but only if we retain the liberties to do so. There's a few historical examples. Does anyone know what these are? First one's a bar televisor, which is an early mechanical television. Then it's a cook and wheatstone telegraph. And then the third one is an thermometer with the first practical office calculator. Each of these devices has a different history, but they affected the same results. The aspirational curve eventually wasn't captured by a particular implementation. Sitting on the left of side of the curve, we'd like to intentionally accelerate the social technical pro processes, but it's a counterintuitive act. Otherwise, it'd be easy. Strong IP enforcement on strong visions diminishes the chances of success. You must let go of that which you love the most. You may get the vision right, or the execution right, or the timing of the team right, but probably not all at once. Facebook, iPhone, Google, Amazon, they're all iterative executions of larger ideas owned by nobody. If you're working on a thing and have a dream, and if it's just you, then you are definitely on the very left. You could argue that for certain use cases, Linux took over 20 years across a big chasm. And for some things, desktop publishing, digital audio workstation, photo editing, or social media, the free software chasm is still not crossed. There needs to be a certain kind of affection for the people, their needs, desires, and aspirations for these to eventually succeed. For, say, the GIMP to overtake Photoshop, the commitment to others with less responsibility is key, because that's how you get the new recruits. So whatever you're working on, it will take years and manifest differently than what you thought. You have to have not have the codependencies with it. They will foster resentment, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Really, you can probably become susceptible to the great man theory. If something is dying, maybe that's the fire you need to rebuild things. Listen to the needs and desires of the ideas. Do one thing. 
do it well, work together, and handle text streams because that's a universal interface. This is actually Unix philosophy by Peter Salas, but I'm serious about it. Good software advice is also good advice for uh, for uh, good <laughs> people advice when building software. Let's go to Tracy Goddard, Soul of a New Machine, 1981. Looking to the VAX, Wex had, uh, West had imagined he saw a, a diagram of DEX corporate organizations. He felt the VAX was too complicated. He did not like, for instance, the system by which various parts of the machine communicated with each other. There was too much protocol involved. He decided that the VAX embodied flaws in DEX corporate organizations. The machine expressed that phenomenally successful company's cautious bureaucratic style. Churchill said we shape the buildings and thereafter they shape us. However, our buildings are different because the programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. He builds his castles in the air from air, creating by exertion of the imagination, or so says Fred Brooks. Regardless, wrecking balls for code are cheaper than those for concrete, so don't be afraid to use them. Here's another Unix philosophy. This time, think about it in terms of people. Make it easy to write, test, and run organizational efforts. Interactive use with humans instead of batch processing. Make do with smaller teams. You need all the engines I talked about to get over the chasm and move the project forward. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Melvin Conway, Datamation, April 1967. We studied yesterday to create a better tomorrow. The future is ours to make. Probably. So, that's good. I did some um, some editing uh, recently, or today. Looks like I shaved two minutes off of at least this presentation, but of course, you know, all of this is subject to the speed upon which I talk and things like that. Um, 40 minutes is good. I I'm happy with that. Uh, you know, I'm, it'd be nice if I could find the beats to pause things down in order to slow things a bit. I don't quite know what it was, and it's going to be slower. So it's going to definitely be slower when I'm there. Um, I don't know why, but I have to, well, I could say the worst case is that it's going to be slower. There was this other thing that I did today. Let me find it. I don't think you saw it because that was when I when the screen wasn't all the way over. I had an idea. Oh yeah, this one. I think this is kind of cool. Um, I just had an idea right before I went on that. Uh, let me pull this thing for. Yeah, this one. I don't like the black bars. I want to recrop this thing. I've been wanting to recrop that thing for a while. How to do this order? Move to top. Um, I'm thinking about on this one. If I could have like some kind of cartoonish graveyard down here, and then the headstones would read stuff like, you know, Sun Microsystems, SGI. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all, all these um. It's basically, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to say, you know, PC Unix vendors. In fact, so l let's go over what I saw today. Uh, yeah, that'd be cool. Because, yeah. So, oh, first of all, this is this shirt is by a company called Snapcraft.io. I don't know if they're still in business. And I don't know what they do. The App Store for Linux. Ooh. So this is this is actually a Linux related uh, shirt, of all things. So what do they do? Search thousands of oh, yeah, I know about snaps. Yeah, it's one of the uh, packaging formats. I've heard about that. Yeah, they might have even used it. Um, anyway, let's go to some of the things that I found. I haven't rotated everything yet. So let's just let's just rotate a few of these things. But I, I need to do it eventually. So yeah, there's there was probably like better ways of doing this than just taking it with my phone. They probably had better tools, but I didn't, I don't wander around the library. So it turned out that I I, I took two um uh, magazines from the time period because the March 1993 turned out that it needed uh, it was referencing a one from 92, and they had that one too, which was nice. So, oh, 
you're actually suggesting to rotate, which is nice. Can you, can I can do it right? Oh, wow. All right, good. Then, okay. Let's start with the Linux one, then we can go to the other ones. So, first one, yeah, they talk about, and this is, let's see, I think they talked about, they mentioned Jolitz here, and they only mentioned Bill, but that's because, you know, the industry was probably much more sexist back then. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Mainly by Bill Jolitz. From my readings, um, he was maybe like, it was pretty even. Uh, between the two of them, so um, who knows? <laughs> oh, and he had a little lady over there that's helping him. Oh, he's, oh I've had the same program computer too, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so these are some of the features that they listed, and when I'm talking about um, some of the benefits for 36, I can maybe put these things in there, but I don't know. Uh, let's see. In spite of all these, you can't get Linux on your local. Neighborhood computer store doesn't come from one particular person. Blah, blah 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 blah. Why did I do this? Yeah, it would not be there except for the community that grown up. Yeah, but that that's you know we've. So here's one of the people things that we've established many times. I mean, <laughs> it's it's always nice to read these articles and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I talk about that. Oh yeah, I talk about that. <laughs> you know, is that whenever I'm like, oh shit, I gotta go look at that thing to see if it. I disagrees with what I've gone over. And then I'm like, oh, it doesn't. It, it seems to just agree. With, but I mean, there's something called uh, uh, exegesis, right? Like I could be projecting that onto these things and say, ah, see, I'm I'm fooling myself and I'm just reading into it what I want to read in order because I, I want, because, you know, there's a, there's a huge cost right now. Um, if it turns out that I'm fundamentally wrong at this point, then I'm fucked. And so there's a sort of a lower level psychological uh, reason for me to not accept evidence that fundamentally uh, disrupts my thesis just because the labor involved is enormous. This is kind of like, oh, I don't know, if you find somebody who is part of a cult, right? And you're trying to say, oh, no, this, you know, you, this person over here is a, a terrible criminal and cult leader. I mean, the... The natural sort of uh, uh, disruptiveness of somebody who said, "Well, you know, I, I, that that's so hard for me to believe because I gave all my money here, I quit my job, I I wear these special clothing, and I live in a in a compound in Idaho or whatever, right? And years of my life have disappeared." And you know, g getting people to that point is really difficult because they naturally have all of these commitments that make it so that breaking through. Uh, what is otherwise obvious truth to the outsiders um, is hard. So I, I'm trying to, and so I know that I'm susceptible to that, just like every other human on the planet. Uh, so that when I'm looking at these things, I'm like, well, I'm hoping that I'm not falling in victim of that. It's saying, oh, um, you know, I have this, a bunch of false uh, uh, premises here. And then I'm reading uh, into these things, I'm extracting like little words and things like that, so then I could do this kind of, oh yeah, they agree with me, and I'm just ignoring the big thing that disagrees with me. I'm hoping I'm not doing that. Um, it's hard because I, I I haven't gotten any feedback on this thing. You know, I've, I've 16th video I'm going to upload, but you know, it's, it's still just <laughs> yelling into the silence of the void. Um, Anyway, let me, hold on, give me a second. Yeah, so, kind of, yeah, so this is, um, oh, they do mention GNU, they mention GNU. All right, that's nice. Yeah, CompOS Linux, of course. And then we have, uh, oh, just getting a, another snapshot. SLS, right. Uh, TSX 11, of course, and then Sunset, yes. And then there was that other thing here, which was, do I have the entire screen here? Oh, I don't. So it was here. 
oh, I messed up. I, I called that 375. It's 325. Okay, well, that's something I need to go back and fix right now. So, that's a very, you know, that's, where's my browser? Oh, is, it, is this the only browser I've got open right now? Let's go to Docs. And then Scale. Then it's 375. No, it's 325. Soft landing software, yeah. Wow. Oh, 325 per disk. Oh. Oh. So it's not 325. It's 325 times 16. Fifty bucks, and then a full one of twenty nine times three point two five puts it at ninety four, which makes it uh, just about cheaper than the cheapest commercial Unix. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, it's no longer a great deal. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would. Th I mean, Canada. I I don't know what the price of post would be at the time. I would imagine less than that. I think that like, you know, this is about the price right. N if I was to send twenty nine discs to Canada right now. It would cost with like US media mail under ten dollars. So, you know, it's it's not great actually. Um let's do this. Who would mail you a copy of SLS? Don't even list it. <laughs> that's just that's, that's so that's so uh, bullshit. Um, let's 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 not lie. Uh, so sixteen times twenty five for about fifty bucks. Mail you a copy of SLS on floppies for about fifty. Yeah, this is not CD. Yeah, or what I could do is <sighs> let's try this. So I bet you check the news groups and uh, mailing lists. Because there was um the first live CD was by Yigit Rezo in nineteen ninety three, and there might be a CD option here that's not being listed. At the time, CD ROMs weren't as dominant as they became in the mid nineties ninety three. You have to assume that um, for any given time that we're talking about, the people you know, the collection of people didn't all have new computers. And so it was people that have computers made between 1987, 88, and 93, right? Past five, six years or so, right? Um, even a machine that I'm using right now is four years old. It's, it's still a very powerful machine. Laptop, you know, I mean, look around you, right? Like, uh, most people have slightly older machines, it's just the nature of things. You know, <laughs> you don't just buy a computer and throw it out every six months. Um, yeah, so that's a, this is a, hold on, you can't see what I'm doing. Oh, and here's a list of different Unixes, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we saw a, a much earlier one from the 80s a couple days ago. Um, so this one's from 92. Is there, how can I zoom in? Oh, it's this tool right here. 
cool. So we've got um, consensus. I don't. I've never heard of that one before. BSD three six with BSDI. Then we had Mach three six, which is actually a really old one from Mount Zenu. Um, things over here. Then we have the prices. There's an interesting thing is that like they chart. Hold on. I think I've got a better a better. I, I made a bunch of scans of this damn thing. Um, did I make make a better one? That had, oh yeah, there it is. This this one had utility to it because oh fucking hold on. I can rotate. Oh oh thank you, you're so nice. Um, look, this is crazy. So here TCP IP networking and NFS. This this look at this. Three hundred ninety-five dollars per user. So it depends on like how many users. Like it's nine ninety per user. This is Xenix. Xenix is always expensive, but even here, and I guess Circle meant it was built in, but it was free, and the dot meant it didn't have it at all. So coherent, which was actually really affordable, um, <coughs> right here. Uh, that was the cheapest one, ninety-nine dollars. It didn't have a graphical interface, I guess. Um, but most of them were like, you know, qu quite a bit more expensive than that. And here's another interesting thing that I saw. Is this one over here, which is support. So some of these people, they didn't have a lot. You know, first of all, you had to do phone calls, of course. You know, And then... Um, I don't quite know what this... There's an error here. I don't think they went 2 to the 12th. That's crazy. Um, but here, the... the you know, SCO had like 85 full-time people, but most of them had like almost nobody. So you'd have to be on hold for a long time to get through to somebody. And then you have to... Like, the support costs. Look at this. It's expensive. This is... Um, who's going to call it? Uh, Mark Williams. It, it really looks like that Mark Williams Coherent was the closest in in like deal structure to uh, Linux. So you have you know ninety nine dollars straight up, and then all these other things kind of, you get kind of get for free. So that was kind of cool. Um, then up here, what was it? I think this was more. What? Uh, oh yeah. So yeah, this this also goes to the stairs. So. Will use multi-user computers connected to terminals, but they say by 1996 there'll be single-user machines. Again, that that's what I said. The productivity things, right? It's expansion of the single-user PC market has been targeted by new product. Yeah, see, that's it. So, so this is this is the staircase, if you will. So it's a matching of the staircase. Uh, let's see what else did I see? And then, oh yeah, uh, Eric Raymond again. Of course, Eric S. Raymond. Always around here. It's like John Quarterman. Uh, after school, yeah, this is IS32. I saw references to that. Um, I don't know too much more about it, but I did see, I remember seeing old references to that. Oh, and so here's 1992. They do mention Linux and 386BSD, but again, they all. I. I I've always seen it like when I see Bill and Lindelitz when I see it referenced in um, in Usenet posts, but here it's I mean it could just be sexism I don't quite know, but whatever. So yeah, so this is learner, learner's permit. Yeah, coherent Unix-like system. Oh yeah, exactly. Linux doesn't require right. So you could you do it on a very modest machine. And then Yeah, I'm a KS toolkit or uh, yeah. Uh yeah. I remember seeing references to that as well. But an interesting thing is they don't mention Minix. I don't know why. Like they're trying to be like really thorough here, right? And they, they list out some of the things here that we talked about beforehand. So much of the advantage PC comes in the nature of the hardware itself. You know, PC hardware from one vendor can be swap, you know, interchangeability, so this is the horizontal stack. Um, then it's say, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
They said like, you know, the 46 is not suck anymore. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Oh yeah, that was the first page. Let me see if I took a picture of it. Oh, here it is. How much cheaper can you, and it said standard $5,000. Um, large color monitor, a bit less than five thousand. By something less powerful CPU has any expenses. The password cut price down three thousand. Still have functioning X computer, right? And they say, okay, yeah, it's not as good. So, so yeah, uh, thread always comes from below, right? Nineteen ninety two, right? Uh, different users value different features. Yeah, here we are again. Um, right, value out of resellers, blah, blah 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 blah. So yeah, nineteen ninety two. So that's what I did today and then I oh, more pictures and then I took a picture of myself <laughs> it's a game I like to play with people I say can you guess where I am right now and then they're like I don't know Union Station it's pretty clearly the, the LA Public Central Library anyway um, that's it for now I guess I gotta go and do all of this again we're still under an hour hey we alright talk to you later